can't say how encouraged I am that there are so many people here to hear a message about facing death. So praise the Lord for all of you. And I pray that as we go through this message, you will retain joy in your heart and a smile on your face. Because we have seen death conquered in the death of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to give you a really great encouragement. I shared this on Friday in the prayer meeting, but I wanted to share it again. I don't know about you, but when you hear some of the famous names on television or celebrities, I sometimes find myself praying for them, but I don't have a great deal of faith that they might change. How about Richard Dawkins? If you don't know who Richard Dawkins is, he's written a number of books to bash up people like me who think God is a delusion. By the way, I don't think God's a delusion. I think Richard Dawkins is deluded. And there's a difference. Well, I get an email, I get a magazine sent to me by a lovely man called Jeff Chapman, who once led a creation seminar in this church 30 or more years ago. Dawkins' right-hand man finds Christ. Josh Timonen was a close associate of atheist Professor Richard Dawkins, travelled with him around the world, having read Dawkins' books. He was fueled with a passion for atheism. He helped launch Dawkins' website, designed his logo, and filmed many of his videos. In his popular book, The God Delusion, Professor Dawkins mentioned Timonen and thanked him for his work. Josh's name can be seen in many of Dawkins' works, both print and video. Dawkins even dedicated his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, to Timonen. Yet now, Josh has rejected atheism and turned to Jesus Christ. In interviews for Living Waters and Institute of Creation Research, which the links are here if you want to look them up, he explains how it happened. He began to ask questions during the coronavirus pandemic when some of his friends in Oregon, United States of America, were defending looting and rioting. He was shocked by their acceptance of evil. Although still an atheist, didn't even believe that Jesus Christ existed, Josh and his family began to attend a church. He said he wanted some of the social benefits of religion, including community and the nice people. Initially, he had no intention of believing what he called the crazy stuff in the Bible, but he began to read the New Testament. He then read The Case for Christ by the former atheist Lee Strobel. We showed that film in this church a few years ago, which he describes as a major turning point. He had to deal with the fact that Jesus was real. Jesus actually lived. He actually died and he actually rose. Josh became a committed Christian and creationist, developed a hunger for Christian apologetics. He admits he doesn't have an answer to every atheist objection to Christianity, but says, I accept Jesus is who he says he is. Josh's testimony reflects what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Josh is now a new creation. God won Dawkins nil. <laughs> Moving on. I'm going to put three verses on the board up there. You can watch them. They are verses where Paul, because of his affection for Timothy and his friendship with Timothy, talks to Timothy about his future death. Paul is expecting to die for his faith. He was actually... Walking, walked down the Appian Way and then they beheaded him. And he's reaching that point in his life where he knows his earthly life is coming to an end. But he writes about it to the person he mentored, the person he loved greatly, almost as his own son, and tells him the truth. Some of you will have had the privilege of being with people who are at the point of death. I've had that as a pastor being with people when they have passed on this life. Because they are believers, even in the sadness of it, there is an immense joy. 
And I want to encourage all of you. This is not meant to be a morbid sermon. Years ago, people used to say, if you want to close down a nice, respectable dinner party, talk about sex, and everyone will say, go away. No problem doing that now, but you talk about death and you'll be out the door. But the Bible talks about it quite clearly. This is what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. This is a very personal epistle to Timothy, his friend. The first one is all about organizing the church. This one is all about being a real godly minister. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now, verse 7 as well. I'm going to read it all through, Janice, and then we'll do each verse at a time. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Thank you. We'll go back to verse 6, Janice. Thank you. There are six things Paul's going to say about his death, and I'll talk about each one of them in sequence. First of all, he says it's like a drink offering. Secondly, he says it's like a departure. Third, he says it's like the end of a fight. The fourth thing he says, it's the end of a race. The fifth thing is, he has completed his covenant of faith with the Lord. And the last one is, I'm going to receive a crown. That's all that Paul is saying here. I'll go into it in more detail about facing death. One of the things that always struck me, because I'm Cornish by birth, is the limited life expectancy of a tin miner. When the children in my class used to complain about having to do English or maths or whatever it was, I think I was a bit bolshy as a teacher, actually. And I stood at the front and sometimes I said, a hundred years ago, the boys would be in the mine and all you girls would be working on top of it. So stop moaning, get on with it. It's a bit hard, isn't it? But Tim Miners had a life expectancy of around about 40. That's how long they live. Because of the conditions they went through. That's why so many of them became believers. When the early Methodist people preached the gospel, they were speaking to people who lived, if I can put it like this, with the regular prospect of death. One of the most moving moments in my time, when I was a Methodist local preacher, I enjoyed finding out about early Methodist history because it was fired up by the Holy Spirit then. And I went to Wesley's Chapel in London. And I walked around the chapel. And on the walls were plaques about people who'd been in that chapel when it first started. And on most of the plaques it said this. The name of the person who died in full expectancy of the resurrection to come. That's how people used to live, my friends. Knowing that at any moment they might meet the Lord. Now that's true of us as well, but we don't see it like that around us to be like that, because most of us in this building today, with some wonderful exceptions, are already over 40 years of age. We'll put that first verse up. There it is. Paul, thinking about his future execution because he is a believer, and Nero, the Roman Caesar of the time, having first of all been reasonably kind towards Christians, is now blaming them for the fire in Rome because Nero is insane. He's insane. So he murders the Christians. 
blames them for everything. Isn't this typical of politics today? All over the world, find somebody else to blame, don't blame yourself. I make that as a general point, you can do with that what you want. It's a drink offering. You see, Paul is educated brilliantly in the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament incredibly well. He was trained by a man called Gamaliel, who you can read about in the book of Acts. The greatest teacher of the law of God, Gamaliel, had Paul as his student. Paul was then called Saul. He's converted on Damascus Road. They change his name because his whole life has been changed. But if anybody understood the Old Testament, line upon line, precept upon precept, sacrifice to sacrifice, it's Paul the Apostle. The drink offering. What's the drink offering? In the Old Testament, it is when wine is poured out at the altar of God as a sign of your self-sacrifice. Jacob did it at Bethel. You can read about that in Genesis 35. Leviticus 23 talks about the drink offering as a sacrifice to God. Now, in researching this, I learned something I never knew before. In Roman culture, at the end of a meal, if you were a worshipper of an idol, you'd pour out wine on the ground to show you were worshipping your favourite idol. Paul's life is a drink offering to God. His very life is poured out for Jesus Christ. Because, of course, Jesus Christ poured out his life for us. And so Paul is taking an Old Testament idea which is a true idea in the law of God, and he is applying it primarily, of course, to the Lord Jesus, whose one sacrifice is sufficient. You don't have to bring a sacrifice to this church. It's already been done for you. Actually, Romans 12 says you do because you are the sacrifice now. The Bible talks about us being living sacrifices to God. You don't bring one, you bring yourself. Paul shows this, teaches us this by his very own life. His life is a drink offering to God. He's pouring it out to God since he was converted. And now finally comes the end when his life is poured out as he goes home to be with Jesus. So that's the first thing he talks about. The second thing he talks about is a departure. Now, tomorrow, my wife and myself are going away to London. We will look at the board at Red Reef Railway Station and we'll look at the departure time and the arrival time and bring Great Western Railway, well, I know that's what it used to be called, God's Wonderful Railway, by the way. That's what Brona, that's what Isambard Brunel wanted it to be called, God's Wonderful Railway. We'll be watching to see if the train's on time. We'll be looking for the departure times. And when I go on the underground, I'll be watching the departure times very closely. Most of you know, you've all been on railway journeys or bus journeys, and you look for the departure time. Here is Paul talking about his departure time. You see, Paul knows he's going to meet with Jesus. Now, none of us can say when that moment will come. But some of us have been in a situation where we've been with people who know their time is coming. They know their time is coming and they're at peace. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you go through the valley of the shadow of death, but you know Jesus is with you and he will bring you safely through. Even that ultimate experience is the end of this life and the beginning of a life with Jesus with no barriers between it. It is already an eternal life if you are a Christian, but you have the whole of eternity to look forward to. This is a massive different mindset to the ordinary person who has no hope. 
who likes to say things like this, when I die, it's all over. No, it isn't all over. There is a God to meet. And it's inescapable fact for every human being that whether you die and think it's all over, it is not all over. In fact, I'd like to say in one way, it's just beginning. It's a departure. As I was studying this, I read something by Jim Packer, who talked about, because he'd written this book in his older age, how should a person prepare to meet the Lord? This is what he said. Be fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't touch sin with a barge pole. Keep short accounts with God. This is a very interesting one. I'm approaching this now in my life at my age. I'm not making any other reference to that. (laughs) Budget your life for 70 years. Because that's what God said he would give people. Many of us are given much longer than that. Praise the Lord, I'm glad. But his challenge was budget your life. For 70 years. The extra years may be given you, but they're all for his further glory. Live in the present moment, knowing and loving and enjoying God. Stay in real communion with Jesus every day. That's Jim Packer's recipe for those of us who are in, shall I say, our third age or third season as a Christian. By the way, for everyone who's under 40 here, I won't ask for hands up, the Bible calls you young. It doesn't really think anyone's old until they get to 40. So if you're under 40, you're still in the youth group. Isn't that wonderful? but I like to think of myself as a junior member of the senior youth group. You see? That's what I think, right? So we're already smiling. This is good because we're talking about death. And we're Christians, and we've got smiles about this and joy, even though it's not a pleasant thing to think about. So I thought to myself, what did some of the other famous Christians say about death? Now, one of my heroes is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if anybody here knows who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was. Thank you, my brother. Bonhoeffer causes controversy amongst some Christians because having been locked up by the Nazis, he was locked up because he was implicated in a plot to kill Adolf Hitler. I don't know what you think about that. You must make up your own mind. But Bonhoeffer said this in his last letter that he wrote to his friend, who was called Bishop George Bell, he said, tell him that for me, this is not the end, it is actually the beginning. And the very next day, the Nazis shot him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a church in London named after him, where the church that my wife attended, Ictus Christian Fellowship, used to meet. That's the Bonhoeffer Centre, because he once ministered in London in the 1930s. I've already told you about John Wesley. I'll tell you what John Bunyan wrote in Pilgrim's Progress. I was talking about John Bunyan a couple of weeks ago, wrote the famous book, first novel in the English language, so I'm reliably informed by Wikipedia, Pilgrim's Progress. Mr. Valiant for Truth said, I'm going to my father's. When the day comes, many accompanied him to the new O side into which he went. He said, Death, where is thy sting? And as Mr. Valiant of Truth went deeper, he said, Grave, where is your victory? So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. 
Now, in my family, there are not many Christians that I'm aware of, although my great-grandfather was a preacher, and he preached teetotalism, which means stop drinking and sign the pledge. I haven't started that campaign yet, but you never know. Apparently, my granny said to my mum, I never knew this till my granny passed away, that I reminded her of her great-grandfather. And I've seen one photograph of him, and I do have a visual resemblance to him. So there must have been some preachers in my family a long time ago. My granny was the only one in my family who would come to with me to church. And she died. And I came home from college to attend her funeral. And as the service went on, that very verse came to me because I wasn't sure where my gran stood. But I felt a tremendous witness from the Holy Spirit as the funeral went on and those verses came to me. Where is your victory, O death? Where is your victory, O grave? And in my heart, I sincerely believe an assurance of the Holy Spirit that I'll see my granny again. Where's the victory of death? In his death, Jesus defeated death. Do you get that? Do you understand that? Do you appreciate that? In his death, Jesus defeated death. It's not a pleasant experience. Woody Allen once famously said, I don't fear my death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. I understand that. You will be there unless the Lord comes back and takes you away to be with himself. But I think what Paul is trying to understand or help us to understand, and Timothy, his mentored son in the faith, is do not despair, Timothy. This is a wonderful moment for me. In fact, at times in my life, in the book of Philippians, seven years before, he talked about the importance of departing, and he actually says, I'm staying here, even though I'd rather be absent with the Lord, I'm remaining here to bless all of you. It's an offering, it's a departure. It's an end of a boxing match, I'm going to suggest. I have fought the good fight. Can we put verse 7 up, please? I have fought the good fight. It's like a boxing match. You see, the Christian life is not sitting in a deck chair waiting for the rapture. The Christian life is a fight. This is not so much a hospital, though there's a place for healing and renewal. Don't misunderstand me. This is a barracks for soldiers. It's a barracks. You are trained here by God's word, ministered to you by fallible people, but hopefully in the Holy Spirit, that you will stand firm and you will follow Jesus the whole of your life. And it is a fight. It's a fight against worldly influences. It's a fight against temptation. It's a fight against the old nature that's still there, even though we've been given the Holy Spirit and a brand new nature. The old one takes a lot of killing off, doesn't it? It's a fight. Are you up for a fight as a Christian? I don't mean go around punching people. But one of my favourite all-time stories was about a boxer who'd been converted. And that weekend, the very first weekend as a new Christian, he stood next to an open-air preacher. And the open-air preacher was being insulted and blasphemed by some big bloke. (laughs) So whenever I go out on the open-air and preach, I like to have some really big guys next to me. That's not justification for punching people. I'm not saying that. But you're in a fight. But he has fought the good fight. You fight the good fight for the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory in your life. Do not expect the Christian life to be easy peasy. I have really heard any preachers, although I've heard about them, who preach the gospel saying, come to Jesus and all your...
because the enemy is suddenly worried about you. And your old nature fights your Christian faith. But you learn as a Christian to deal with that. That's why believers' baptism is so important because it's a burial with Jesus and the death of the old life symbolised. So he fights the good fight. And then he says, I finished the race. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint being a Christian. It's a marathon. I've never run a marathon. I'm not good enough. Some of you have run half of the marathons. You probably trained up to run the whole marathon. Good on you. School that I would run the first part of 400 metres really fast to help my friend who was going to overtake me and win and get points for our house. And I can still remember the teachers watching me belt off on this 400 metres thinking, he's mad. By the time I got halfway through, I had such a stitch, I almost walked over the finishing line and my friend didn't win anyway, so that shows that was a stupid idea. But it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Eugene Peterson said, it's long obedience in the same direction. It is a long obedience in the same direction for the Lord. That's the Christian life. Paul did it. Paul did it. He really did what he's saying here. And he kept the faith. See, so you're, if you're a Christian, you're in a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The covenant is symbolized by communion. And the communion represents an ongoing, intimate relationship with the Lord. That's what the Christian life is. And Paul has kept the covenant faith. I know it's the Lord Jesus Christ who's given him the strength. I know it's the Holy Spirit who enables you to live the Christian life. But there is a cooperation with the Holy Spirit, and there's a cooperation with the Word, and your will is involved. You choose to obey or choose not to. God gives you the power under his sovereignty of a real choice before him. So when you get up in the morning, you have a choice that day to live for his glory or live because others are controlling you, which I don't agree with, or live for yourself. No, the Christian life is dying to self and living for his glory. Amen? Amen, it is. And Paul did it. He fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. Right, here's verse 8. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And so a Christian understanding of death is following our departure from this world and into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. At a certain point in history, we all stand before him, not because we're being condemned. Will you hear this very clearly? It is not condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not a judgment to condemn you. It is Jesus Christ looking at every simple act of all of our lives and rewarding obedient people. A crown is given. There are crowns for different things. Here Paul describes a crown of righteousness given to him by a righteous judge. It's a reward for living the Christian life genuinely, authentically, and sincerely. And I want everyone who's here in this congregation to live the Christian life sincerely and authentically and genuinely. Not because I want you to get brownie points in heaven, but because it's about the glory of Jesus Christ. And God is just and fair and rewards his people. Now there may come a point where we cast all our crowns down before him. 
because he deserves all praise and glory. But I read about Queen Elizabeth, who's now departed, who once said in an interview with somebody who reported it, I can wait for the moment in my life when I cast my crown down before him. But Paul says, there's a crown of righteousness awaiting me because the righteous judge sees everything I've ever done and ever said, even thought. Do you know, a glass of water, it says in the Bible, in Matthew, a glass of water given in my name, if you gave it to someone weaker, it's as if you gave it in my name and I recognise that. So I've said before in this church, but I repeat myself because I am getting old and I repeat myself a lot. If nobody else noticed that bit of service you gave for the Lord, Jesus did. Jesus notices every single thing. I encouraged a young man here, I'm not going to mention his name, and said, I'm very impressed because you vacuum up on Wednesdays. Get yourself a beard and a black briefcase, you'll be an elder. <laughs> God sees every single act of service ever done in his name. Other people don't see it. Sometimes I walk into my house and I don't even notice some of the beautiful things that are in there and I have to be pointed out to me. In the garden, I'm even worse. I'm trying to notice all the beautiful hellebores. I've actually learned the name some flowers. But Jesus notices everything. What every single person has ever done for him, he's noticed it. So I don't have a problem believing in a reward system in the glory because Jesus is fair. He's absolutely fair. And Paul did an enormous amount for the glory of God. Spread the gospel in a lot of Europe. Now I'm going to finish because I'm going to introduce the last song. I decided to find out how J.B. Phillips translated this passage of scripture. J.B. Phillips was teaching boys in Sunday school in the 1940s or round about then. They didn't always understand the complications of the translation that he was using. So he thought to himself, perhaps I'll have a go at translating it correctly so that they would understand it better. It doesn't mean that the old versions are bad, they're all wonderful. The King James Version is brilliant. But we don't all fully understand it sometimes, and I think it's good for Christians to read one or two different translations, as well as one that's word for word, and give you a literal appreciation of the text. It sometimes helps some of us to read something like the New Living Bible, or the New Living Translation, or J.B. Phillips. Bit old hat now. I don't expect many people in this church read J.B. Phillips now. It's all a bit old hat. It's 1960s-ish. This is what he said. Translating the passage I gave you. The time has come for me to be gone. I have fought the good fight to the end. I have run the race to the finish. I have kept the faith. All there is to come now is a crown of righteousness reserved for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. I don't know about you, but I'm longing for Jesus to come. To sort the mess out to deal with all the injustices in the world and in my own nation, to deal with all the people who hold power so that they can exploit people for their own ends and deal with a whole lot of them if they won't repent. And I'm going to tell you that's exactly what he will do. You read Psalm 2. If you don't believe me, 
take five minutes today to read Psalm 2. That's exactly what it says. The Lord holds in derision the rebel nations and rebel leaders who fight against him. Kiss the Son, embrace the Lord, fear him and serve him, or it will not go well with you. Blessed are all those, it says in Psalm 2, who love and follow the Lord, who trust in the Lord. So while the group comes back up, I'm going to introduce the last song. Could we put the first verse up, please, Janice? I'd never heard this song until I went to a funeral service of a very important Methodist layperson in Stillians. This would be nearly 40 or more years ago. I'd never heard this song. When I heard it sung at the funeral, I cried. One, because I think the tune's really lovely, but even much more important than that is the words are really important. This is a song based on letters of Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford Rutherford was what used to be called a divine, a Scottish divine, 1600s, 1660, around then. I thought to myself before I was going to introduce this, when I was sitting there thinking, one day somebody might call me a Cornish divine, I wouldn't mind. Not a Cornish mine, but a Cornish divine. See, the word divine means someone who's devoted to the Lord. Now, Rutherford was put in prison twice for being a Christian. He was a minister in Aberdeen. He was locked up twice for preaching the gospel. In his life, he lost two children. So this man wrote these letters. He was a wonderful professor of theology. Even more important than that, he was a pastor. So he cared about people. And so, he wrote lots and lots of letters. And then a lady came, on, came along called Annie Cousin, who took his letters and turned them into this hymn. Now, the original has 17 verses. But we're not going to sing the original, so don't worry. We're going to sing the Redemption hymnal version, but we are missing one of the verses. So I'm going to read the missing verse. Then I'm going to ask Jane to play the tune. The tune is called Rutherford, after Samuel Rutherford, who wrote the letters on which Annie Cousin wrote the words. The second verse in the redemption is not one we have. It doesn't matter, I'm going to read it. O Christ, he is the fountain, the deep, sweet well of love. The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. There to an ocean fullness, his mercy doth expand. And these are the two lines that made me cry at the Stivian's funeral of the beloved Methodist Christian. And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. That for the Christian is what you have ahead of you. Total, absolute, utter glory. Because it's full of Jesus. So I'll ask Jane to play the tune for the first verse and then we'll stand to sing.